You know, mild depression actually affects just about everybody. And mild depression and anxiety can be helped often by just a little bit of humor. So i have just, if you're out there and you're not feeling great this morning, join the 99.9 around you. And uh, so I, I thought I'd maybe make you feel a little better. I was reading some jokes this week. I thought they were funny. Uh, where did Mary go after the explosion? The answer, everywhere. Uh, what, and that, and that might encourage you. Okay, let me go a different direction. What, what do you call an arrogant criminal going down the stairs? A condescending, condescending. I thought that was cute. How about this one? A lion will never cheat on his wife, but a tiger would. Ooh, I shouldn't have said that one. Anyway, a man was in a terrible car accident when he lost his left arm and left leg. He's all right now. Uh, that's bad. I shouldn't have done that. Did you hear about the kidnapping at school? It's okay. He woke up. Uh, I told you these were bad, but you're feeling better already because you're thinking I'm not that dumb. Did, did you hear about the two radio antennas that got married? The wedding was okay, but the reception was awesome. <laughs> My dog has no nose, the fellow said. The other guy said, how does he smell? He said, terrible. <laughs> Some people have trouble sleeping. But I can do it with my eyes closed. <laughs> you feel better? No? You know, anxiety disorders actually do uh, affect a lot of people. They're more common than you might realize in the United States. Forty million adults in the United States have some form of an anxiety disorder. Forty million. That's 18 percent of the population. That's about two out of ten. Think about that. Count to ten. One, two, you see? Uh, there's all kinds. The National Institute of Medical uh, Mental Health says there's all kinds. There's generalized anxiety disorder called GAD. There's panic disorder. Now, GAD affects 6.8 million people. Uh, panic disorder affects 6 million people. Social anxiety disorder, that's not wanting to be in crowds. None of them are here right now. That's 15 million people. Obsessive compulsive disorder, OCD, you've heard that a lot. That affects 2.2 million, maybe not as many as you think. Uh, Post-traumatic stress disorder, a lot of our military get this. PTSD, 7.7 .7 million. Major depressive disorder affects 14.8 million people in the U.S. Persistent depressive disorder, PDD, affects 3.3 .3 million people in the U.S. And then there's, of course, bipolar or manic depression that affects a great deal. Uh, but be aware, and, and this is something really important, be aware that such labels sometimes, uh, labels are used to write other people off. And that's not really good. You know, Jesus was, they tried to write Jesus off. They said, well, he's just mad or he has a demon. They tried to write him off too. So don't, don't let a disorder write you off, Amen. Uh, there have always been counselors and or however you would call it, uh, comforters, uh, but mainly they've been around for the very powerful in the past and the common people like you and I did not have access to people like that to help us. We might have family members that would help, but there was no paid counseling except for the very rich. But in the Bible there were counselors for the kings, Ahithophel, the Galanite, uh, brilliant man apparently and he was a counselor to David before he turned against him uh, Zechariah uh, was a wise counselor Jehonathan and that's jo not Jonathan but Jehonathan was uh, David's uncle and he was one of his counselors so th there were counselors around some of them were counselors in the sense of like you know a board if you will a board of directors and not necessarily as so much a counselor for psychology reasons but there have been those in fact David kind of did that work for King Saul but how do you overcome depression especially if it's not that severe how do you overcome it 
There are a lot of ways you can do it, kind of a natural way. And I read an article on that from uh, basically Reader's Digest on Stealth Health. And I thought they were interesting because I thought, who's got time or the money to do this? But I thought it was interesting. Number one, spend at least one hour each week with a close friend. That'll help you if you're having depression issues. Two, play with the dog a few minutes every day. I don't have a dog, so I'd have to find somebody's. Number three, get a 12-minute massage three times a week. Well, that's nice. Okay, number four, drink one to two cups of coffee or tea each morning. Well, we're already doing that, so I don't know what that's about. Number five, look for mood-boosting foods. Well, what food doesn't boost your mood? Number six, get more omega-3s. Number seven, take your vitamins. Number eight says, first thing in the morning, lie on your back with your head hanging off the edge of your bed. Isn't that the way everybody wakes up? Okay, number nine, look in the mirror and force your lips into a smile. Y'all ain't been doing that much lately, have you? Number 10, pull an all-nighter. If you're having trouble sleeping, they recommend you stay up all night for several nights in a row and then you'll find that you can fall asleep. Number 11, bang on something. Not a person, but apparently drums are something that people actually, it actually relieves some of their depression. Uh, 12, sleep in a different bedroom. Well, if you cause too much trouble, you will be. Number 13, go easy on yourself. That's probably the reason you're feeling bad now. Number 14, break out of your routine today. Number 15, take a 10-minute walk three times a day during the winter. You'll work up a sweat here if you do that. <laughs> and number 16 said exercise. So those are some suggestions from, you know, just Reader's Digest. But I, I got to tell you, as a person who's had a problem, and, and I mean, it was a severe problem caused by uh, a medication, uh, I found basically some principles that, that really will help. And... If you really have a problem, let me know. I'll share these in de depth. But basically, number one, you need, there's a responsibility principle. Uh, you got to start taking steps to get well by accepting the full responsibility for it. You can't expect everybody else to fix you. Uh, stop blaming others for your condition. Stop blaming God. God's not going to remove a problem like that, but he will help you remove it. But he will not do that remove it like that. At least I've never seen that happen. Uh, there's the confession principle, and that is you admit or confess uh, your responsibility to yourself. Start telling people you're responsible. And uh, confess it to God and then to some key people in your life. You see that even in the 12-step programs. you got to tell somebody. There's the commitment principle, and that is you accept the idea or you commit to the idea of getting well and let fear drive you. Let the fear of staying where you are drive you to do something, you know? Uh, and the commitment, make a real commitment openly to do something about it. And then uh, let shame drive you to do something about it. So work on that commitment. And there's the accountability principle, which is basically you tell everyone that you're getting better even when you're not. Because as you tell people that, you're holding yourself accountable. You're forcing yourself. You're holding yourself accountable. You're telling yourself that you're going to get well. Because most people who are depressed keep telling themselves, I'm depressed and there's nothing I can do about it and it's getting worse. Well, tell yourself you're going to get better. It's the same lie. You say, well, that's a lie. Well, the other's a lie too. So tell yourself something that's more positive. And then finally, there's the change principle. And that is... You change your behavior, and you start faking and acting like you're feeling better. Believe it or not, that'll actually make you feel better. If you'd smile, you'd feel better. Try it. No, you're not going to try it. I see that. You're miserable, aren't you? Hey, most of the people here must be depressed. You can, no, I'm just kidding. You can change your uh, everything. Whatever you can do to change your environment, your diet, your health, your habits, your attitudes, any of those things... Uh, one of the best things, a little simple principle, can I give it to you to help you? You want to learn how to control your mind? I had to learn this a really, really hard way, the really, 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 really hard way. Here, here's a little truth on psychology 
and fixing your brain. You want to, you want to hear it? Okay, here it is. Okay. If I ask you to not think about an elephant for the next, a, a pink elephant, a pink elephant for the next three seconds. See if you can do it. One, two, three. It's really hard to not think about that pink elephant, isn't it? Have you noticed that? Because you can't undo a negative. That would be a negative. So you have to overcome it with a positive. The way to not think about a pink elephant is to put a blue elephant in your head and start thinking about a blue elephant. Now, if you start thinking about a blue elephant or a blue zebra or something like that, and then all of a sudden for three seconds you think about a blue zebra, can't you? And a bunch of blue animals out on the field, and all of a sudden we've forgotten all about that pink elephant. That's how you control your mind your mind. You focus on the positive, not the negative. It's the only way you can do it, but you can't control your mind if you do that. It's a simple little concept. See, Jesus is the great physician, but he's also the great counselor. In fact, he's the wonderful counselor in this text. It says, Isaiah 9 and verse 6, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor. I think those are two together, actually. Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. Wonderful Counselor. I believe He is the great Counselor of our soul. And I believe that you can overcome almost anything by using Him. Let's look at four helpful questions, though, okay? Can we do that? I'm going to look at four helpful questions today that I believe you will find are useful to you. I had that up. I didn't even know. Number one. It's an important question to ask. Do you believe I can help? So many people don't believe anybody can help them. They don't believe God can help them. They don't believe a counselor can help them. Nobody can help them. Do you believe I can help you? That's what Jesus asked when blind men came to him. See, the blind cannot see what they cannot see. The blind cannot see what they cannot see. Listen to me. If you need counseling, you cannot see what you cannot see. That's why you need counseling. If you're in a mess psychologically, you cannot see what you cannot see. Quit expecting that you can see it. You need somebody outside yourself to tell you. You're not going to like what they tell you because if you liked it, you would already seen it. And you need to be told what you cannot see. But even though they could not see what they could not see, they followed him anyway crying after him. That's what it says in verse 27. The blind cannot see what they cannot see, but they persisted all the way into the house where he was. You going to follow Jesus? You going to follow him or are you going to persist in following him? And you think, well, what difference does that make to my psychological health? Let me tell you something. It may be the only solution. The blind cannot see what they cannot see, but they believed. He said, do you believe that I'm able to do this. Do you believe that I can help you? And they said, yes, we do. He said, well, it's gonna, I'm going to heal you according to your faith. You better. Because you can't be healed according to somebody else's faith. You've got to be healed according to your own faith. So if you want to get better, you've got to believe that God could help you. Okay? You've got to persist. You got to persist. You got to follow him. You got to persist. You got to believe. But you got to believe. And you, you might say, well, what does that have to do with getting better? I'm telling you, uh, as a person who's been there, it has everything. Number two, why are you so fearful? That's an important question to ask. Because a lot of our problems are driven by fear. A lot of our problems are driven by fear. The fearful doubt. And cannot accept the storm that they're facing. In Mark chapter 4, they're in the boat, verse 37, and the boat's in a storm. You ever feel like your life's in the middle of a storm? If you're having psychological issues, that's exactly what it feels like. It's in your head's in a storm. So how in the world could God allow this? Oh, it's his fault. The fearful doubt and cannot accept the sinking because now the boat's sinking. It says that the boat begins to get full of water. The boat's sinking. The boat can't sink, but it is sinking. It is sinking. Why is God allowing my boat to sink? Folks, every one of you had a sinking boat. 
you have a sinking boat nearly every month, don't you? Don't you? I mean, you not enough money to go around. Haven't you noticed that there's more days in a month usually than there is money? There's more problems than you can shake a stick at sometimes, right? You're just like, I can't believe there are this many things happening on top of each other. Have you noticed that? And they don't just come. They come boom, 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 boom. And you're like, whoa, 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 whoa. When is it going to end, right? That's the same feeling in it. But if you're depressed, it makes it even twice as bad. So the fearful doubt and cannot accept that there's a sinking. And the fearful doubt and cannot accept the sleeping. How in the world? They go up there and the Lord's got his head on a pillow and he's sound asleep. How in the world can the Lord be sleeping and doing nothing in the middle of my crisis? How many people have felt that way? God hadn't done a thing to help me. I don't know about you. What is God that? That's the attitude. You notice that? Why won't God do something to fix this? That's the attitude. He should have woken up and fixed it. And the answer is, why are you afraid? That's what he woke up and said. He woke up and turned to them and said, look, there's a storm around us. Do you not care that we're about to drown? And he looked at them and says, why are you afraid? You see, folks, listen to me. If you're a child of God, that's okay. If the boat sinks, it's okay. If you're right where you ought to be spiritually, I might be okay with the boat sinking. But how in the world can the boat sink if the Lord's on there? That's kind of what he's asking. If you really believed, why in the world is that such a problem to you? So the question comes back again to faith. Faith causes, a lack thereof, causes us to be fearful. Number three. It's tough stuff, isn't it? It's actually quite harsh. Number three. Do you want to be in your right mind? Well, what kind of question is that to ask? Well, of course I do. Well, Luke gives three answers to that. You can't be empty of significance. I don't know if you remember the story, but in Luke chapter 8, it's the story of the man or the two men possessed with a legion of demons. You know this story? And Jesus cast them out. They went into a herd of swine and pigs who can swim quite well go off a bluff and all drown, which is very unusual. So they all drown. Thousands of them drown off this hillside. And the people around it, who probably made their living from the pigs, are more upset about that than about the man getting well. But they come, and when they get there, they find him clothed. He'd been running around naked all this time. He's clothed, no longer cutting himself, screaming. He's in his right mind and clothes. And so, uh, they're not happy about this. They didn't, they'd rather the, the have the pigs and let the man be crazy in the tombs. Okay? Don't affect my finances. Leave the man crazy. Leave him, you know, just leave him alone. But no, that's not what the Lord did. He healed him. And now the man that's healed wants to know, can I go with you? And the answer is, oh, you have a significant place. It's to go home to your family and not tell them, the scripture says, show them what the Lord has done for you. If you, if you want to get well psychologically, you have to show it where it really counts in your family. If you're depressed, you need to go home and be a Christian there. I don't, you don't need to be a Christian up here. And fool, you can fool us four hours. Be a Christian in your home, among your people. Show your faith there, where everybody goes. Wow, did you see how mom handled that? Did you see how dad did that? Wasn't that awesome? Wasn't that great how little Susie showed her faith there? That's where you show it. Right there. So 
you got to have some significance. So if you're having problems, show some significance. Go do something significant. And then you cannot be empty of spirituality. In Luke chapter 11, it says that a man who has a demon cast out of him. Okay, the Lord healed him. Has a demon cast out of him, right? He goes away, walks through dry places, and then comes back looking in the window to see if maybe he could get back in. And when he gets back, there's nobody in there. But the house has been all cleaned up. It's garnished. It's got decorations everywhere. It looks like it's ready for a visitor. And he thinks, you know what? Not only am I going back in there, I'm going to go find some buddies. So he goes and gets seven more demons, more wicked than himself, and he moves in. Here's what you can't do. You can't leave your soul empty. You, if you're having trouble, you've got to fill it up with spirituality. You need to get your Bible out. You need to read it. You need to read prayer. You need to listen to gospel songs. You need to be in study with people. You need to fill it up. You need to grow some. But it all comes back again to faith. And that will help. And I speak from experience on that. Then you can be empty and you can't be empty of your supply. You need to have a supply. Luke 15 verse 17 the young man who left home, ran away, became the prodigal, as you know. And he's about to starve to death because of famine and struck where he's at. It says that suddenly he came to himself. So he's like he was crazy, right? He'd gone off the deep end. And he came to himself when he realized, I'm starving to death and I'm going to eat pig food. That's not a supply. But back in my father's house, there's food enough and the supply. If I can just humble myself and go get the supply from him, tell him I'm sorry about what I've done, it still comes back to a relationship with the father. You need a supply. Staying away from church because you're mad won't fix nothing. But go to the supply house and you might just get better. So do you want to be in your right mind? You need a little significance. Go show people how you changed. You need some spirituality and you need that extra supply regularly. And then finally, you want to get well. The counselor Jesus would ask, do you want to get well? You would think that the answer would always be yes. But it's interesting that he would ask that question, don't you think? See, years can pass without getting well out of indolence. In, in John 5 and verse 5, he says it's been 30... How long have you been here? How long have you been waiting on this pool to boil up again so you can be healed? 38 years. Now, I don't know about you, but it's been 38 years since you've been to a doctor. It's been too long. 38 years and he hadn't done anything really except go sit near where there was help for 38 years. So I'm thinking he's been a little lazy about it. What do you think? 38 years? But more than that, you said, well, he was there. Well, he also had a, a problem of self-pity. It says in verse 7, I have no one to help me. I can't help you if you don't want to help you on any level. I don't care what we're talking about. If we're talking about money, I can't fix your money problems if you won't stop spending. I can't fix your relationship problems if you won't stop offending. I can't fix your emotional problems if you won't come and talk. I, you can't fix what you can't touch. Folks want you to fix without touching. Folks want you to give them money without asking them what their situation is. Have you noticed? Help me out, but don't ask no questions. Just write me a check here. That's all I want. Write me a blank check 
And, we, and that's the way I want my church to help me. Really? So if you're spending it on drugs, that's okay for everybody? You're okay with us just writing money to a drug dealer. Why don't you just cut out the middleman and send the drug dealer up here? Or are we allowed to ask some questions occasionally? Amen? And so I'm just suggesting it's a small thing, this thing about self-pity, I have no one to help. you got to ask somebody, and you got to be willing to let somebody help, but you got to ask directly, interactive. And then... Years can pass without getting well just by making excuses. Another, every time I go, someone beats me there. That's just an excuse. After 38 years, I'd be laying on the edge of the pool. There wouldn't nobody beat me, okay? I'd be laying every day. Put me down there on the edge of the pool. I'm rolling over as soon as I see the bubbling, right? Seriously, 38 years. So the counselor, Jesus, was asked, do you really want to get well? And that's a good question to ask if it took 38 years. Don't you think? That's a good question. Do you really want to get well? You see, there are a lot of people who don't. They want you to think they want to get well so that they get your sympathy, but they really don't want to get well. They want your money, but they don't really want to get well. They want your help, but they don't really want to do anything for themselves. They want to feel sorry for themselves the rest of their life, but they don't really want to do anything to actually make their situation better. And that's a real truth. It's a harsh truth, but it really is a truth. So do you believe I can help? That's a good question. If you don't believe anybody can help you, probably not going to get help. Why are you so fearful? See, the truth is, is that fear and faith are connected, and that's a lot of the problem. And do you want to be in your right mind? Well, you have to do some things to get in your right mind. And do you want to get well? That's a good question to ask. Here's the deal. And, and now I'm going to get real serious, okay? You thought I was real serious. Now I'm fixing to get real serious. Real, real serious. Please, please, please pursue help. Don't allow your anxiety or depression to win. Every one of these cases up here, they allowed their anxiety and their depression to win. Ernest Hemingway had just had electro, electrical shock therapy, went home, and ended it. Robin Williams, a lot of people don't realize, had Parkinson's. And actor Robert Schneid, Rob Schneider says that he had just changed his medication and he was on a Parkinson's drug that one of the symptoms was suicide. Freddie Prince wrote, I must end it. There's no hope left. Folks, that's never true. There is always hope because it's spelled J-E-S-U-S. Vincent Van Gogh said, the sadness will last forever. No, it will not. Love will last forever. Because his name is G-O-D. Michael Heisman is a 38-year-old. He's the only one up there you probably don't recognize. He did a study. He had 1,900 pages of a missive five-year study. That he concluded every word every thought and every emotion come back to one core problem. Life is meaningless. And on the steps of the Memorial Church at Harvard campus, he ended his life. He is totally wrong about all of his conclusions. Every word, every thought, any emotion come back to one core truth. And that is life has meaning and everything we do has meaning. Amen? It means something. Then, of course, we all know John Winter. Most of us were here, right? Remember John? Love John Winter, didn't you? He's my favorite on tea. Jonathan Winter, uh, WFLA meteorologist for 13 years here in town. He's 39 years old. They said he was probably having an affair at the time and the shame got to him, but the truth is is that he was on Xanax, and he basically told his friend that he wanted to end it all because he'd embarrassed himself and his family, and he just couldn't live with it. You know, that's terrible. 
You know, I, I don't know if you get this, but listen to me. I don't know where you are. But there's not a person in this room that doesn't matter. And you matter to us. And you matter to the Lord Jesus. Don't you believe this hogwash that you don't matter? Don't you believe that? There's not anybody in here that isn't worth us all going to the wall to save. And you, you, I'll tell you something else. You ain't, if you got a problem, you ain't going to fix it without faith. You're not. It's going to take a lot of it. A whole truckload of faith. So I can't fix everything this morning. I can't resolve. I can't even get it clear even in my own head. Here, let me tell you what I can suggest. You need to start somewhere. If you're not right with the Lord, maybe you need to start somewhere and come forward this morning. We'll pray for you. If you're not right with the Lord, maybe you need to repent of your sins, confess the name of Christ, and be baptized. Or maybe you need to talk to someone after this is over. Whatever the case is, let me tell you something. It better start with Jesus because that's the only one I know that can absolutely, totally give you hope because He's the anchor of our soul, sure and steadfast. That's Jesus Christ. He's the hope of our salvation, and He's the hope of your life. Won't you come if you need to while we stand and while we sing?